Yes, well, it's great to be with you, Bev. The truth is the Belt and Road Initiative has really become a defining feature of Xi Jinping's foreign policy and a quite a dramatic symbol of China's rise as a great power. I think kind of this uh, gathering, touting its success and how you view it as a success depends on where you're looking from. So China really touts the BRI as a gift to the world that has generated huge economic benefits. China claims that 420,000 jobs have been created in BRI countries and 40 million people lifted out of poverty thanks to BRI generated growth. Others, uh, America, many of its allies, for example, see the BRI as far less benign, a political tool aimed at boosting China's global standing while helping its companies you know, get a leg up and also saddling poor countries with debt. However you look at it, it does in some sense contain the implicit suggestion that China's development model is better for poor countries than that of the West and the pageantry of Xi and Putin together could have not have been clearer. Yes, indeed. Let's talk a little bit about um, how China has funded it. And, and as you point out, a lot of this infrastructure, w the workers were often Chinese. They weren't necessarily workers from the countries that they were being invested in. And the countries have taken that on as a loan, which could be a big burden when we're talking about countries in Africa, t countries in the Pacific. Yeah, it varied actually quite a bit, uh, depending, because as you noted, there really is no, uh, the, you know, the Silk Road language around the BRI is misleading. There's no geographic bar to joining or where projects took place. So where where the workers came from did vary quite a lot. And there has been a lot of complaint, particularly from Western officials, that China was setting debt traps, um, ensnaring unwary recipients of lending. The idea being that when a borrower defaults, you know, China can extract concessions such as ownership of vital infrastructure, one alleged example example, of course, was the port uh, Hambantota in uh, Sri Lanka in 2017. Um, after the country kind of struggled to, with their debt, China took it over. But there's actually little proof of deliberate traps being set there or elsewhere. I think what you're seeing now, and you saw this certainly the last few days in Beijing, is that Chinese banks, like other countries when they went out and kind of lended in the emerging markets for the first time, were quite sobered and maybe, um, you know, undertook not insufficient risk assessment. So you're certainly um, seeing that. So for example, in 2010, less than 5% of Chinese lending abroad supported borrower countries in distress. By 2020, that figure had risen to 60%. Um, and so they've been, Chinese banks are now really reassessing their lending practices. And I think that's also what you're seeing in how the belt and road, or how the belt is tightening, shall we say, of the belt and road. <laughs> Mr. Xi is emphasizing small but beautiful projects. And what that means is, you know, less um, less huge kind of ambitious projects that go, go too long, uh, smaller that will be more focused, generate better returns, and in areas that are strategically aligned with China's interests. So think digital infrastructure and green technology. Yeah. It also struck me, you know, I was what, what, looking at pictures and reading about one of the showpieces of Belt and Road, and that was the significant new airport in Vietnam. What sway might China have in a in circumstances of a form of conflict, say like with Taiwan, with a facility like that? It's, a, it's an interesting question. And I think one of the things that we're also seeing as the BRI turns 10 as the, and as you know, the focus is becoming tighter, is the focus is closer to home. You also certainly saw that in who attended in Beijing this week. There were 24 world leaders, considerably fewer than the last BRI forum four years ago, where there were 37. Um, you already mentioned Putin. There was uh, a, a number of uh, important Asian leaders there. And um, I, I do think that it's difficult to see how it would play out, particularly once the infrastructure projects are completed. Uh, China, in theory, does not have any ownership stake over them. Uh, obviously, Indonesia's railway being another good point and example. And Jokowi did attend the BRA forum. There was some question whether he would. Um, but I think Vietnam, Indonesia, these are countries that are still very much trying to remain unaligned. Um, but they don't want to turn down the offer of funding from China either, because it's it to meet vital infrastructure and development needs, it's not, you know, an insubstantial sums that China, it's not insubstantial sums that China is offering. Yeah, it is interesting, as you say. Now, you know, it's no surprise that there's this belt tightening around BRI, because as we've spoken about, China is facing massive economic challenges, and there's further fragility in the property sector with another big company set to default. 
Yes, that's right. On October 10th, Country Garden, which is a very large private property developer, warned that it would formally default on its offshore bonds for the first time. In late August, that was when the company started getting into trouble. And what's interesting is that actually the Economist Intelligence Unit, when the Evergrande crisis started, we identified Country Garden as a one of the most best performing property sector, uh, property developers that wasn't kind of lashed with the debt of Evergrande. But as the property crisis has continued, even the kind of more responsible lenders have been coming uh, under scrutiny or have been running into financial difficulties. Um, as, as that is happening, we're seeing authorities kind of accelerate the resolution of Evergrande. Um, and we think that this kind of serves as a warning to other struggling property developers. The former chairman of Evergrande was detained and is facing criminal charges. Um, and of course, the authorities are not pleased that he prioritized and the leadership at Evergrande prioritized their personal wealth um, over kind of uh, the, those of, of homeowners. And the, it's going to, the companies, uh, the authorities are going to really struggle to complete Evergrande some 700 unfinished projects. Um, so I think this will, will certainly so, be sobering for um, uh, Country Garden because, you know, Country Garden sales have really stumbled. I think it was 80, uh, just about 80% year on year in September, or sorry, tumbled by 80% year on year in September. Um, and so the disorderly failure of a company like Country Garden, which would really carry systemic importance, would really, I think, neutralize the very small recent market recovery and extend the downturn in the market uh, for another few years. And so it's really crucial that this stabilizes. Yeah, and still no sign really of Beijing being interested in bailing them out. No, um, we think that the completion of the Evergrande projects, which will become an authority, a priority, excuse me, will probably involve local governments, perhaps with the help of loans provided by the central bank. Um, but Evergrande, as we know it, will very soon exist no more. It kind of doesn't exist in a sense as we knew it anyway already. Yeah. Matty, always great to get your analysis. Thank you. Thank you.